Hey Apostle Prophet, why do you look so sad? Muslims are always being very mean to me. They are always refuting me of my videos. Have you tried talking to them? I always try to talk to them. I mean, when I'm being a complete bigot, talking to them really helps. I mean, it always goes well. I think David Wood has said some career-ending embarrassing statements today. I mean, to be honest with you. Talk to them? What do you think, I'm some kind of a Muslim savage? Talking to people and making peace, these are things Prophet Muhammad taught his followers. He said, Shall I not tell you of what is better in degree of uh, degree than extra fasting, prayer and charity? They said, of course. The Prophet said, Reconcil Reconciliation between people. Verily, corrupted relations between people is the razor. You can read about it in Sunan Tirmidhi 2509. So I can't do that. I have to do the opposite of that. You're right, Vidwan. We cannot follow Prophet Muhammad and his examples. We must always oppose him. You know, if you really want to oppose Muhammad, there is a great way to do that. Really? How do I do it? Well, Muhammad said in a Sahih narration, A man among those before you was wounded. He was in such anguish that he took his knife, slit his wrist, and let the blood flow until he died. Allah Almighty said, My servant has preceded me with his soul. So I have forbidden paradise for him. You can read about it in Bukhari 3276. So we can see from this narration that committing suicide is forbidden for Muslims. Both Allah and Muhammad forbid this. You know, if we really want to sh oppose Islam and Prophet Muhammad, we could just commit suicide. That will show them. David, that's a great idea. What better way to oppose Islam than to commit suicide? But I already tried that and it didn't even work. I was about to commit suicide. So I almost did it. Also, I don't want to die. I mean, what will happen to all the money and fame I'm getting for hating Islam? Don't worry, Redwan. This time I'll help you. Also, think of this as a test. I mean, you don't believe in Jesus. But if we both jump while praying to Jesus, I mean, he might just resurrect us. I mean, it will be a great test of my faith and it will prove to you that Jesus exists and you can join me as a new Christian brother. Oh my God, David, you're right. I always wanted to be a Christian. This way I can be sure that Jesus is real and I can become a, f a fully fleshed Christian. Amen brother, let's do it. Wait guys, I'm gonna do it too. Shut up Abdullah, no one cares about you. You gotta be shitting me! I can you can't keep me cooped up in here, okay? I am a peacock, you gotta let me fly! <laughs> let's do it, David, let's do it. Oh, and just in case it doesn't work, let's aim for the bushes. You thinking what I'm thinking, partner? Aim for the bushes. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh everyone Welcome back to another episode of the Islamic Defense Podcast Well guys, I'm back with Radwan <laughs> You know, it's been a long time since I last made a reputation to Apostate Prophet But uh, yeah, Brother Farid, he did a very good job In case you haven't checked out his channel At refuting Radwan uh, or aka Apostate Prophet Planning on refuting every single one of his reasons As to why he left Islam all 22 of them so in case you haven't seen my previous ones i highly recommend them uh inshallah it will be in the playlist there will be a playlist uh where you can check them out and i've already refuted his first two reasons as to why he left islam so let's take a look at and see what mr apostate popo or apostate prophet has to say regarding his third reason as to why he left islam desire for women in the Quran, Muhammad placed verses that often settled his uh, sex issues and family issues and stuff like that. I have some examples of these, even though I want to go into those uh, things much further in separate videos that I dedicate to those topics. Here, he is using the circular reasoning fallacy. He says that in the Quran, Prophet Muhammad placed verses. I mean, isn't that what you're trying to prove? I mean, why is that in your premise? <laughs> I mean, this is circular reasoning because he never proved that Prophet Muhammad or any other human beings for that matter wrote the Quran. He just assumes that he did. 
Also, Ridwan just because there are personal things in the Quran doesn't mean it was written by Prophet Muhammad. You claim that because the Quran resolves uh, Prophet Muhammad's personal issues, therefore it was written by the Prophet. Now, if that is the case, then I could say that the 13th Amendment of the United States Constitution abolished slavery. In section 1, it reads, Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as punishment for a crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. So here we see that the United States Constitution solved a lot of personal issues by abolishing slavery. I mean, this solved a lot of personal issues faced by the slaves, such as torture, abuse, discrimination, marriage issues, etc. So does that now mean that the United States Constitution was written by the slaves? Of course not. It's completely fallacious to suggest otherwise. Same with the Quran, it solves a lot of personal issues of Prophet Muhammad and many other people because it's a legal document from God. It deals with people's personal issues and Allah SWT uses Prophet Muhammad as an example to show us that this is how you should do it. That doesn't mean that uh, it was being written by the Prophet. It deals with personal issues of various different people and not just Prophet, sometimes even the enemies of Islam. So. And also, I've showed that in Apostle Prophet Exposed Part 2 that there are many examples where the Quran goes against the Prophet. This completely contradicts this theory. Inshallah, I'll discuss uh, such incidents like this later on, but for now, let's continue with some of the examples uh, Ridwan brings. But just to give them as examples, I mean, we are talking about verses here where um, Muhammad has a problem with his wife because she was accused of adultery. So. He comes up with this great solution. Oh yeah, let's just let's just let Allah say something in the Quran. That will mean something, right? <laughs> and he solves the problem through the Quran, through Allah's word. Again, here he's committing the post hoc argo prompter hoc fallacy. He's assuming that because the Quran verse was revealed after Aisha Radhanu was accused of adultery, therefore her being accused of adultery is what caused the Quran verse to come. However, this is fallacious because according to a very long hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, Aisha Radhanu said that this accusation was spreading for almost a month. She said, On that day I kept on weeping so much so that neither did my tears stop nor could I sleep. In the morning my parents were with me and I had wept for two nights and a day till I thought my liver would burst from weeping. While they were sitting with me and I was weeping, an Ansari woman asked my permission to enter and I allowed her to come in. She sat down and started weeping with me. While we were in this state, Allah's Messenger came and sat down and he had never sat with me since the day they forced the accusation. No revelation regarding my case came to him for a month. You can read about this in Sahih al-Bukhari. The hadith number is 2661, uh, book 52 and hadith number is 25. So now here is the thing. If the Prophet was making up the Quran, then why on earth would he wait almost a month to declare that his wife is innocent? <laughs> I mean, seriously, think about it. How does that even make any sense? I and mean, seriously, ask yourself this, Fadwan. Imagine you are making up a holy book, right? And your wife gets accused of adultery. Would you wait a month to declare that she is innocent? Or would you immediately make up a verse and say that your wife is innocent? <laughs> I mean seriously, tell me which one makes more sense. If the Prophet was making up the Quran, he would never wait for a month to declare that she is innocent. He could just make, a verse, make up a verse and say that she is innocent. Now the real reason why he was waiting was because he was expecting a Quran verse to be revealed regarding this matter. And he would only wait, do that because he wasn't making up the Quran. He had to wait for Allah's orders. However, the thing is that the Quran verse didn't come. Which is why he actually started consulting with other people on regarding whether or not he was going to divorce her or not. The evidence can be found in the same hadith, uh, which reads, In the morning, Allah's messenger called Ali bin Abu Talib and Usama bin Zayed, and he saw the divine inspiration delayed, which means that he was expecting uh, maybe some, some commandment from Allah Taala, but nothing came, to console them about divorcing his wife, Aisha. Radhiallahu anha. You can read about this in, again in the same hadith, Sayyid Bukhari 2661. Sorry, 2661. Book number 52 and hadith number is 25. Again, we can 
clearly see that from this idea that even though the prophet was hoping that a Quran verse would be revealed regarding this, nothing came. Which is why he started consulting with other people to decide whether or not he was going to divorce her or not. Again, if he was making up the Quran, he certainly wouldn't wait a month and he certainly wouldn't expect a Quran verse and think of divorcing her when nothing was revealed. I mean, he could have just said, boom, there you go, a Quran verse, and now she's innocent. However, nothing like that happened. Because the Prophet was not making up the Quran, he had to wait for Allah's order to come. And this completely contradicts Ridwan's theory. However, I'm not done with his stupidity yet. There is actually more evidence which shows that this verse was revealed by none other than Allah himself. So, for example, in the exact same hadith, Aisha Radhanana mentions a very interesting detail about the revelation. So, whenever a Quran verse would be revealed to the Prophet Muhammad he would oftentimes sweat. And, for example, Aisha Radhanana mentions this in the same hadith. She says, By Allah, Allah's apostle had not got up and nobody had left the house before the divine inspiration came to Allah's apostle. So, there overtook him the same state which used to overtake him when he used to have... Uh, so basically he used to go into a, a, into a state when a Quran verse would be revealed. He was sweating so much so that, that drops of sweat were dropping like pearls, though it was a cold, wintry day. Uh, you can read about this in Sahih al-Bukhari 2661. So some may say, well, there's nothing special about sweating. People sweat all the time. However, what's interesting is that he was sweating in the middle of a cold day, as Aisha Radhanana describes. This is quite strange because people can't just make themselves sweat, especially in a cold day like this. So the question arises, if the Prophet was making up the Quran, how on earth did he make himself sweat in an instant like that? I mean, especially on a cold day. Also, according to Aisha Radhanana's description, this is something that would happen every time a verse would be revealed. So this is definitely not something normal. Now I can already see naturalist and materialist atheists objecting to this by saying, ah, there's a natural explanation for this. Clearly, maybe he was suffering from excessive sweating. I mean, which is a valid point. So let's investigate that. Was he suffering from excessive sweating? The short answer is no. Here's why. Now according to an article by WebMD, which says, normally your sweat glands uh, produce perspiration uh, that's carried to the skin surface when the air temperature rises. You develop a fever as you're exercising or you're feeling anxious, nervous or under stress. When those factors are no longer an issue, the nerves that signal sweating are put on hold. Now, as you can see, none of this is true for the Prophet because he wasn't exercising and he definitely wasn't stressed or anxious. If that was the case, then he would be sweating all the time and not just the time when the verse was revealed. Also, this type of sweating was brief, so this is definitely not some type of condition. Because in the same hadith it says, when the state of Allah's Messenger was over, he was smiling. However, what about excessive sweating? Those can happen even in cold weather. The article says regarding this. But people who have uh, hyperhidrosis experience, experience excessive sweating to the point that moisture may literally drip from their hands. Uh, hyperhidrosis causes them to sweat profusely even without a cause. Now, according to the article, there are two types of uh, hyperhidrosis. Uh, primary hyperhidrosis, also called focal hyperhidrosis, causes excessive sweating in the hands, under palm, face, and feet without any apparent reason. Also, the article says, when your body is overheated, when you're moving around, when you're feeling emotional, or as a result of your hormones, then nerves activate the sweat glands. When these nerves overreact, it causes hyperhidrosis. For instance, someone may need uh, to think of a situation that causes them anxiety in order to break out in, uh, in a huge amount of sweat. Now, the atheist might say that, well, he was probably thinking of an anxious situation. Now, first of all, there is no evidence that he had an excessive sweating disorder. However, let's say for the sake of argument that he was suffering from a condition like this. Even then, it is still impossible for anyone to immediately stop this state of sweating willingly. Yet, in the hadith, we see that the Prophet immediately started sweating and then immediately stopped as soon as the verse was revealed. That's impossible. <laughs> 
Sure, you may be able to trigger the sweating somehow, but it's impossible to stop it willingly. Now, the article also says, doctors aren't sure why people have primary hypohidrosis, although it may be hereditary. Uh, many people tell their doctors that they've experienced excessive sweating since they were a child. This is interesting because doctors are still not sure what causes this. However, we can still see that this doesn't apply to the prophet because, well, first there is no evidence of him suffering from primary hypohidrosis when he was a child. So this theory doesn't hold. This proves that he wasn't suffering from this condition. Also, you can't exactly, you know, trigger this condition and stop it at will. So it's not possible for him to do that. Now, what about the second type of excessive sweating? According to the article, secondary hyperhidrosis, also called generalized hyperhidrosis, causes excessive sweating all over the body or in, the, in a large area of the body and can be easily caused by excessive heat as well as medical condition or medication. The doctors give more details regarding some of the reasons why the uh, condition may occur. The article says, sweating from secondary hyperhidrosis is different from primary hyperhidrosis in that it tends to happen all over or in one general area instead of just the hands, under palms, face or feet. Unlikely primary hyperhidrosis, this type of this type is more likely to cause sweating during sleep. So we can see this already doesn't apply to the prophet because he wasn't sleeping when this happened. Here's a few conditions that can cause hy uh, secondary hyperhidrosis. Uh, number one, pregnancy. Well, this definitely doesn't apply to the prophet. Then there's diabetes. Again, there's no evidence to suggest that the prophet was suffering from any type of diabetes. As a matter of fact, he was quite healthy. Uh, it, it can be caused by hypothyroidism again some of the symptoms of these conditions are fatigue and mood swings and none of them apply to the prophet uh, also mono, uh, menopause can cause this again doesn't apply to the prophet because you're the man uh, obesity can cause this again the prophet was healthy he wasn't obese uh, Parkinson's disease can cause this again no evidence to suggest that the prophet was suffering from this uh, rheumatoid arthritis this condition comes with joint pain and swelling again the prophet wasn't suffering from any of this uh, lymphoma again this condition includes fatigue and itchiness again none of this applies to the prophet then there's gout again this condition comes with joint pain and this symptoms also doesn't apply to the prophet and the last one is infection and also the prophet didn't suffer from any type of infection that we know of or there's no evidence of it so we can clearly see that there's no natural explanation for why the prophet was sweating in a cold day then all of a sudden stopped i mean this only happened when the Quran verse was revealed which means since there is no natural explanation for this it has to be something supernatural however if you're not convinced then there is more evidence to suggest that the Quran revelation was often accompanied by something supernatural. For example, there is one hadith where we read uh, is narrated by Sahal bin Saad as Sadi who said, I saw Marwan uh, bin al-Hakim sitting in the mosque so I came forward and sat by his side. He told us that Zaid bin Thabit had told him that Allah's messenger had dictated to him the divine verse. Not equal are those believers who sit at home and those who strive hard and fight in the cause of Allah SWT with their uh, wealth and lives. Zayed said, Ibn Maktoum came to the Prophet while he was dictating to me this verse. On that, Ibn Maktoum said, O oh Allah's Messenger, if I had power, I would surely take part in jihad. He was a blind man, so Allah sent down revelation to his apostles saying that while he was, his thigh was on mine and it became so heavy for me that I feared that my thigh would be broken. Then the state of the Prophet was over after Allah revealed this verse, except those who are disabled or injury or blind or lame, etc. Uh, again, this hadith can be found in Sahih al-Bukhari, the hadith number is uh, 2002. 832. Now this is quite bizarre because I understand some objecting to the fact that the prophet was sweating in the middle of a cold day. However, how on earth does someone increase their weight in an instant like this and then decrease it right after? I mean, how is that even possible? Here the hadith report suggests that when the Quran verse was being revealed, the prophet became so heavy that his thigh was, which was over on uh, Zaid ibn Thabit's uh, leg, felt like he would crush his leg. I mean, how does anyone increase their weight like that? It's impossible. Now, some may argue that, well, maybe he just put some force into his thigh. Sure, maybe that caused some, that may cause a small pain, but to say that his leg was so heavy that it almost crushed him is absurd. I mean, especially since the prophet was quite old at this point and he wasn't pushing his legs with full force. Uh, it was just his thigh. However, even if you were skeptical about this, then consider the next evidence. 
which completely destroys any objections you may have. So there's this another hadith which says, On the authority of Abu Arwa al-Dawusi, uh, who said, I witnessed the revelation coming to the Prophet, may Allah peace and peace and peace be upon him, while he was riding his beast. It screamed and contracted its forelegs, and I thought that they would break. Sometimes it sat and sometimes sometimes it stood up, straightening its, uh, straight, uh, straightening its forelegs till the burden of the revelation was gone, and the Prophet got down from it, sweating in the street of pearl. You can read about this in Kitab al uh, Tabakat by Ibn Saad, page number is 228. Now, this is quite remarkable. Now, I get why people might object to Zaid Radhanano's leg feeling like it was being crushed while the revelation was coming to the Prophet. However, it is impossible for someone to become so heavy in an instant that even his camel cannot carry him, that it has to sit down or have a hard time standing. Now, I understand why a human being like Zaid, Zaid Radhanano might have a problem but how on earth does a camel have difficulty standing up when the Quran verse is being revealed remember a camel is not some weak animal that would have a difficulty carrying heavy loads which means when the Quran verse was being revealed it put such a weight on the Prophet even the camel couldn't bear it this is even mentioned in the Quran itself Allah SWT says in the Quran indeed we will cast upon you a heavy word uh, you can read about this in Quran chapter number 73 verse number 5 Again, there is no natural explanation for this, which shows that this is probably something supernatural. So I'm going to put this argument in a logical form. Premise 1. We know that the Quran verse B was being revealed to the Prophet. Uh, when it was being revealed to the Prophet, he would suffer from sweat in even in the middle of cold and it would oftentimes put a heavy weight on. Premise 2. We find no natural explanation for these events. Conclusion. Therefore, it has to be something supernatural. And another thing is that this trust with one's argument is the fact that there are many cases where the Quran did not resolve the Prophet's personal issues. As a matter of fact, it even criticizes him for it. For example, we read this in the hadith in the following hadith which takes place after the battle. Father. The Prophet wasn't sure what to do with the prisoners. So the hadith reads, The Messenger of Allah said to Abu Bakr, Omar and Radhan, uh, by the way this hadith takes place after the battle of Badr was over when the Muslims have won the battle and they have captured a lot of prisoners. However, the Prophet didn't, wasn't sure what to do with the prisoners. So he was asking Abu Bakr Radhan, and his other companions what to do with them. So the Messenger of Allah said to the said to Abu Bakr and Omar, uh, peace, uh, peace and peace be upon them. What is your opinion about these captives? Abu Bakr Adhanu said, "They are our kith and kin. I think you should release them after getting from them a ransom. This would be a source of strength to us against the infidels. It's quite quite possible that Allah may guide them to Islam." Then the Messenger of Allah said, "What is your opinion, Ibn Khattab?" Uh, and Omar Adhanu he said, "Messenger of Allah, I don't hold the same opinion as Abu Bakr. I am of the opinion that you should hand them over to us so that we may cut off their heads." Uh, uh, I mean, hand over Akil to Ali that he may cut off his head uh, and hand over such and such relatives to me so that I may cut their hands off, cut their heads off. They are the leaders of the disbelievers and veterans among them. The Messenger of Allah approved the opinion of Abu Bakr and did not approve of what I said. So basically, Prophet Muhammad he agreed with Abu Bakr and decided that uh, he was going to release the prisoners uh, in return of ransom instead of killing them. So the next day, when I came to Messenger of Allah, وسلم, I found that both the Abu Bakr, both Abu Bakr Radilhanhu and Prophet Muhammad was crying. I said, O Messenger of Allah, why are you and your companion shedding tears? Tell me the reason, or I will weep, or I will at least pretend to weep in sympathy with you. The Messenger of Allah وسلم, said, I weep for what has happened to your companions for taking ransom from the prisoners. I was shown the torture to which they were subjected. It was brought to me as close to this tree. He pointed a tree close to him. And God revealed the verse. It is not befitting for a prophet that he should take prisoners until the force of the disbelievers have been crushed for the end of the verse so yet ye the spoils of war lawful and pure so allah made beauty lawful for them you can read about this in quran verse uh, chapter 8 verse uh, verse number 67 uh, the hadith you can find the hadith in sahih muslim 1763 so this clearly contradicts ridwan's theory here we see that allah SWT criticizing the prophet for deciding to release the prisoners for ransom here he didn't agree with the prophet's decision he didn't solve his personal problems the way the way he wanted it as a matter of fact he allah SWT actually criticizes the prophet for his decision Again, Again, this clearly contradicts Ridwan's theory. I mean, if this is the case that the Prophet made up the Quran, then why is he criticizing himself? I mean, why is the Quran reject rejecting the Prophet's decision? Again, let's put this argument into a logical form. Premise 1. We know that Ridwan's theory claims that the Quran was written by the Prophet to 
because it solves his personal problems and appeals to him. Premise 2. If we find something in the Quran that doesn't solve the Prophet's personal problems and doesn't appeal to him and actually contradicts this idea, then it would contradict Ridwan's theory and it would prove his theory false. Premise 3. In the hadith Sahih uh, al-Muslim, uh, 1763, we find that the Quran verse 867 does not solve the Prophet's personal problem and does not appeal to him. As a matter of fact, it actually criticizes him. Conclusion. Therefore, Ridwan's conspiracy theory about the Prophet making of the Quran is proven false. Now let's continue. The Quran also contains uh, a verse that settles a problem that Muhammad has with his wives again. After an incident where Muhammad has sex with a sex slave, as he can do in Islam and in Arabic culture back then, his wives have a problem with that. And um, he just tries to settle that by threatening them through a Quran verse, which says that he can divorce them and can get better wives in them. Okay, first of all, Ridwan is again using circular reasoning. He never proved that the Prophet, uh, Prophet Muhammad wrote the Quran and yet he keeps barking like a dog saying that the Prophet Muhammad apparently threatened his wife with a Quran verse, which is a lie. Now, regarding Quran verse uh, chapter 66, verse 1 to 5, there are some serious differences of opinion regarding the evidence. Ridwan was extremely dishonest in the video and completely ignored evidences that contradicts his view. Either he didn't know uh, which makes him incompetent or he did he lied which makes him a scumbag. <laughs> Either way people shouldn't take him seriously. So there is two versions of this story. One is that the prophet used to drink lots of honey. However his wives didn't like that. Uh, so he promised his wives that he wouldn't drink this anymore. That's when this verse is revealed. Here is the evidence from Sayyid al-Bukhari who's narrated by Ubaid bin Omar who said I heard Aisha Rajan say the prophet sallam, used to stay for a long while with Zainab bin Jash and drink honey honey at her house. So Hafsa and I decided that if the Prophet came to any of us, she should say, I detect the smell of makfir, uh, which uh, means that a nasty smelling gum or teeth in you. Have you eaten makfir? So the Prophet ﷺ visited one of them and she said to him similarly, uh, Prophet ﷺ said, never mind, I have taken some honey at the house of Zainat bin Jash, uh, but I shall not drink it anymore. So there was, so then the verse is revealed, O oh, Prophet, why do you ban for yourself that which Allah has made lawful? If, you if your two wives turn in repentance, to Allah, addressing Aisha and Hafsa, but the Prophet ﷺ disclosed a matter in confidence in some of his wives, namely saying, but I have taken some honey. You can read about this hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari 5267. The second version of the story is that he wanted to marry uh, marry the Copt or brought her over to Hafsa's house and that upset Hafsa Radhanhu. The evidence of this can be found in a hadith narrated by Umar Radhanhu where he said the Prophet ﷺ did not go to his wives because of the secret which Hafsa had disclosed to Aisha Radhanhu and he said that he would not go to his wife for one month as he was angry with them. When Allah Taala admonished him for his oath that he would not approach uh, Maria. We read about this in Sayyid Bukhari 2468. Also, the Prophet never threatened his wives. In this version of the Hadith, if anything, he asked for their opinion and asked them if they wanted to stay with him or not. And they said yes. In the same Hadith, it says, uh, when 29 uh, days had passed, the Prophet Sallam went to Aisha first of all, she said to him, he took an oath that you would not come to us for one month and today only 29 days have passed as I have been counting them day by day. The Prophet ﷺ said the month is also of 29 days. Uh, that month consists of 29 days. Aisha said when the divine revelation of choice was revealed to the Prophet starting with me saying to me I'm telling you something but you need not hurry to give the reply till you can consult your parents. Aisha knew that uh, her parents would not advise her to be to divorce the Prophet. Prophet ﷺ. So the Prophet ﷺ said that Allah has said O Prophet say to your wives, if, if you desire the life of this world and its glitter, then come. I will make provisions for you and set you free in a handsome manner. But if you seek Allah and his apostle and the home of the hereafter, then verily Allah has prepared for the uh, good doers amongst you a great reward. Allah, Aisha said, am I to consult my parents about this? Indeed, I prefer Allah and his apostle and the home of the uh, hereafter. After that, Prophet ﷺ, uh, gave the choice to his other wives that they may also, and they also gave the same reply. I, I, as Aisha did. We read about this in Sahih al-Bukhari 2468. So we can clearly see that Ridwan completely lied. <laughs> Prophet ﷺ never threatened his wife. As a matter of fact, he asked them whether they want to stay with him or not. Now whether this story is true or not, that's not the point. The point is that he never threatened them. And now none of these two versions prove that the Prophet wrote the Quran, by the way. And this again falls into the post hoc ergo prompter hoc fallacy. Not only that, we have evidence that contradicts this view 
view again. For example, we read in the following hadith that narrated Salim's father that he heard Allah's messenger وسلم, when raising his head from bowing of the first raka of morning prayer saying, Oh Allah, curse so and so and so and so. This is the Prophet saying this. After he had said, Allah hears him who sends his praises to him. So basically he's saying the prayer, uh, Our Lord, our praises to you. And then Allah SWT revealed, not for you, O Muhammad, till the end of the verse, they're the, indeed the wrongdoers. Say Sayyid uh, Bukhari, we read about this in Sayyid Bukhari, 4069. Then in another nation, we see that narrated by Salim uh, bin Abdullah bin Umar, who said that from his father on the day of Uhud, the messenger of Allah SWT said, O oh Allah, curse Abu Sufyan. O oh Allah, curse Al Harith bin Hashisham. O oh Allah, curse Safwan bin Umayyad. He said, so the following, they, and then the following verses reveal that not for you is the decision whether uh, Allah turns in mercy towards the, these people or punishes them. You can read about this verse in chapter 3, uh, the verse number is 128. The hadith, you can read about this hadith in Jami al Tirmidhi, the book number is 47, hadith number is 3274. So here we can clearly see that when the Prophet ﷺ wanted Allah to curse uh, uh, some of his enemies, Allah actually criticizes him. So here we see that the Quran actually solves the personal problem of the enemies of Islam. So does that now mean that the Quran was written by the enemies of Islam? <laughs> I mean, seriously, think about it. If a holy book solves someone's personal problem, and therefore that means that whoever's problem is getting solved is the writer, then that means that according to this hadith and the Quran verse, the Quran was written by the enemies of Islam. <laughs> I mean, again, this completely contradicts Ridwan's theory. Again, I make the same argument. Premise 1. We know that Ridwan's theory claims that the Quran was written by the Prophet because it solves his personal problems and appeals to him? Premise 2. If you find something uh, in the Quran that doesn't solve the Prophet's problem and doesn't appeal to him and or appeals to someone else, it would contradict Ridwan's theory and it would prove his theory false. Premise 3. In the hadiths in Sahih al-Bukhari 4069 and Jamil al tirmidhi book 47, uh, hadith number is 3274, we find that the the Quran verse 3128 does not solve the Prophet's personal problem and does not appeal to him and it actually appeals to someone else. <laughs> so in conclusion we can say that therefore Ridwan's theory, conspiracy theory about Prophet making him the Quran is false. It's a pure fabrication and a false allegation. Anyway let's continue with the refutation and see this idiot's last point. Another issue is that Muhammad married the, the wife of his son-in-law Zaid. His son-in-law had a beautiful wife called Zainab, um, whom apparently Muhammad uh, even arranged for him. And one day Muhammad uh, came into their house and saw her, saw her in beautiful clothing and said, oh my God. Uh, <laughs> after, after that incident, she went to her husband and told, her about the, told him about this issue. And uh, the husband, Zayed, he couldn't, he couldn't take that and she went to Muhammad and offered his wife to him but Muhammad said keep your wife keep it um, well after a while Zaid couldn't get over his thought so he just divorced her um, what happened afterwards is Muhammad married her <laughs> now Zainab had to marry Zaid but the marriage didn't last very long the following story can be found in the scriptures of Tabari a very famous interpreter and historian of the early times of Islam a year later, Muhammad visited the house of Zayd to talk to him, but Zayd was not at home, so that his wife Zainab opened the door scantily dressed, thinking that it is Zayd at the door. When Muhammad saw her that way, he was shocked and he was very impressed with what he saw. He left the house afterwards and Zainab told her husband Zayd about the story. Zayd, having problems with Zainab already, visited Muhammad and told him that he can have his wife because the marriage isn't going very well anyway. But Muhammad told him to keep his wife and to fear God. What Zaid didn't know at this point was that Muhammad really wanted a piece of that Zainab. Not long after that, Zaid divorced Zainab. And guess what happened? Muhammad married her immediately and released the Quran first. Let's see what the Quran first says about Muhammad and his desire for Zainab. And remember, O Muhammad, when you say it to the one on whom Allah bestowed favor and you bestowed favor, keep your wife and fear Allah, while you concealed within yourself that which Allah is to disclose. 
and you feared the people, while Allah is more right that you fear him. So when Zayd had no longer any need for her, we married her to you, in order that there not be upon the believers any discomfort concerning the wives of their adopted sons, when they no longer have need of them. And ever is the command of Allah accomplished. Chapter 33, verse 37. So what the Quran is saying here is that Muhammad indeed desired Zainab, whom he married to his adopted son, while she was still married to his adopted son. This is a disgusting lie against the Prophet. This story of Prophet liking Zainab is weak, unauthentic, complete fabrication and a lie. Inshallah, I'll show you exactly how much of a liar you are, Ridwan. So Ridwan quotes Tabari. At first I was impressed. <laughs> I was like, wow, Ridwan, you were improving. However, then I realized, actually no, he probably didn't and you probably stole it from some anti-Islamic website. I highly doubt he even read Tabari, but here's the actual hadith from Tabari. According to Yunus bin Abu al Allah ibn Wahab ibn Zaid who said the Messenger of Allah had uh, married Zaid bin Haitha to Zainab bin Jash, his parents, uh, his paternal aunt's uh, daughter. One day the Messenger of God uh, went out looking for Zaid. Now there was a cover of hair cloth over the doorway but the wind was lifting and uh, basically it's the story that uh, you know that the Prophet saw uh, you know Zainab in revealing clothes uh, and after this this happened uh, uh, apparently the, uh, the Prophet was was, you know attracted to her and 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 then uh, you know the Zaid finds out and he goes to the prophet saying that he want to divorce her and then he says uh, you know don't divorce her etc basically this version of the story uh, in this hadith that uh, uh, Ridwan quotes from al Tawari. this is the version of this story however here's the thing <laughs> this hadith is fabricated so basically this hadith is from al Tawari, Jami al Bayan uh, Fi Tafsir al Quran uh, volume number 20, uh, 274, Al-Tabari, Tariq al-Rasul, and Al-Muluk, you can read about this, uh, volume 2, 563. So, the narrator, Ibn Zaid here, is Abdul Rahman bin Zaid bin Aslam, al other way now he was from the generation that succeeded the followers of the companion and died in the year 798. His report, therefore, is a mudal. Moreover, he was considered as a weak narrator by almost all the scholars without any opposition. You can read about this in Tadib al-Tadib by Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, volume number 6, 177 to 179. Uh, the, the hadith number is 363. We can clear cut see this is uh, just a fabricated story. And there is no solid evidence which suggests that this uh, event happened or to suggest that Prophet was even sexually attracted to Zainab. Uh, this is why famous uh, scholar Ibn Kathir says, even uh, he said that even Zarid and even Abi uh, Natim uh, narrated reports from some of the Salaf, may Allah's peace and mercy be upon them, which we would like to ignore completely because they are not Sahih. We will not quote them. You can read about this in Tafsir Ibn Kathir, uh, volume number 6, uh, the page number is 424. So Ibn Kathir is confirming what I'm already saying, which is that this is a weak hadith. Uh, and we, so we can see that none of this tafsir report is sahih, which is why almost all the scholar considers this story to be a complete fabrication and a lie. This story is never mentioned in any, any of the sahih books. I mean, it, you will not find it in sahih Bukhari or anything like that, which is why, interestingly, <laughs> which is why Ridwan uses Tabari, you know, because he's probably got this from some anti-Islamic website. And he steals it and think that maybe somehow this proves a point. <laughs> Not knowing that this is a fabricated hadith, or at least a weak hadith, like it's not, and which contradicts other Sahih narration, which says nothing about Prophet being sexually attracted to uh, Zainab. So, what actually happened is that Allah SWT revealed to the Prophet that Zayd would divorce Zainab, and the Prophet would then marry her. He also knew that Zayd would come to him with a complaint. This happened exactly as Allah SWT said. So basically, the Prophet ﷺ was warned uh, in, in the past about what would happen between uh, Zainab and Zayd. So he knew they would get a divorce and he knew from Allah SWT that he would marry uh, Zainab. Uh, how 
However, uh, when this actually happened, when uh, Zaid divorced uh, or wanted to divorce Zainab, he went to the Prophet uh, complaining about Zainab. He told him, the, however, when uh, uh, Zaid asked Prophet ﷺ whether he was going to divorce her or not, Prophet said, no, you should keep your wife uh, because he was afraid that people would criticize him. That's why he said, no, you should keep your wife, even though he knew that they were going to get a divorce and he would marry her. But if he didn't want to say that because he thought that people would criticize him because because of that. If he married Zainab, people would criticize him. Again, this has nothing to do with him seeing her and falling in love with her. This is what the Quran verse is referring to, that he was hiding the fact that he wanted to, uh, the fact that he was going to marry her. You can read about this in Tafsir of Sheikh Abdul Rahman Al Sadi, may Allah have mercy on him, who said about the verse, uh, chapter 33, verse number 37. The reason for revelation of these verses was that Allah wanted to prescribe a law for all believers that adopted sons do not come under the same ruling as real sons in any way and that there was nothing wrong with those who had adopted them marrying their wives after divorce. Now this was one of the regular custom which could not be changed except by a major incident. So Allah SWT wanted to wanted this law to be introduced by the words and actions of the Prophet Muhammad SAW. When Allah SWT wills something he creates a cause for it. Zaid ibn Haritha was called Zaid ibn Muhammad. Uh, the Prophet Muhammad SAW of his of him, had adopted him and he was called by that name until the verse uh, came who says that call them adopted adop sons by the names of their fathers. Now again this also contradicts uh, Ridwan's theory because uh, why would he change his son's name? I mean he's the one who gave it to him, right? I mean so which one is it? Like uh, it contradicts his theory because if he was making up the Quran he would never change his son's name. That's ridiculous. But anyway so it was revealed and then he, he became known as Zaid ibn Haritha. I mean it's not like it changed his relationship with him. He is still his adopted son. So he was married to Zainab bin Jash, uh, the daughter of a uh, paternal aunt of Prophet Muhammad It had occurred to the messenger that if Zaid divorced her, he might marry her. And Allah decreed that this is something that was going to happen between her and Zaid, that which would cause Zaid ibn Harith to come back to the Prophet and ask for his permission to divorce her. Allah said, and remember when you said to him, Zaid bin Harith, uh, the free slave of Prophet Muhammad on whom Allah has bestowed grace, i.e. by blessing him with Islam, and you, Muhammad, have done favor by, by freeing him. When he came to you to consult you about leaving her, you told him, advising him, despite what you felt in your heart, uh, keep your wife to yourself. Do not leave her. Bear whatever you face from her with patience and fear Allah in all your affairs in general. And with regards to your wife in particular, for fearing Allah encourages you want to be patient. But you did hide himself that which Allah will make manifest. Now, what was he hiding? Now, what he was hiding was that if Zaid divorced her, the Prophet Muhammad would marry her. That's what he was hiding. That's what Allah is talking about. Because you did fear the people. When Allah SWT says you did fear the people, uh, what he means is that when you did not disclose that you were thinking, whereas Allah had better right that you should fear him. Because fearing him brings out goodness and words of evil. So when Zaid had accomplished his desire from her means that when he willingly turned away from her and separated from her, he gave her to you in marriage. And we only did that for an important purpose, which is so that in future there may be no difficulty for the believers in respect of the marriage, the wives of the adopted sons, when they see that you married the former uh, former wife of Zaid ibn Haritha, uh, who had previously been named after him. You can read about this in Tafsir al Sadi, uh, page number 1665 to 1666. Now, you can also see evidence for this from multiple Sahih hadith. For example, this one hadith who says, Mamar Katada, Katada said that Zaid came to the Prophet and said, Zainab has been tough on me and with her tongue and I wish to divorce her. But the Prophet said, keep keep your wife to yourself and fear Allah. The Prophet however wished that he would divorce her but he also feared that more what would people say if he asked Zaid to divorce her. At this Allah revealed that and you were concealing in your heart what Allah was going to reveal and you were fearing people while Allah is more entitled to be feared by you. So when Zaid finished his desire to her, Katada explained when Zaid divorced her, we gave her into marriage. We read about this in Al Sanai Abdul uh, Razak Al Tafsir, uh, editor Muhammad Mahmoud Muhammad Abdullah, volume number 340, number uh, 2346. This short chain is authentic, however, um, it is supported by another chain of narration back to Katada via Yazid bin Zafar uh, and Said bin Abi Aruba, Jami Al Bayan, fi Tafsir Al Quran. 
by Al Tawari, even Jarir volume number 20, uh, page number 273, Al Tawarani, uh, Majum Al Kabir, volume number 24, uh, 42, page number 42, number 140. <laughs> now, here's some renowned scholars who agree that the story of Prophet being sexually attracted to Zainab is a complete fabrication. They all say and agree that the only thing Allah SWT revealed in the verse is the fact that the Prophet would marry Zainab. If the Prophet has sexual feelings or love for Zainab before marriage, then why didn't Allah SWT mention anything regarding that? I mean, if this is the case, that Prophet Muhammad has sexual feelings or love for uh, Zainab, then Allah SWT would have mentioned that in the Quran verse, right? I mean, but he didn't say anything like that. Now, he only revealed that he would marry her. Also, another thing is that this verse is completely embarrassing for the Prophet. So why would he, if he is making up the Quran, why would he ma make up a verse like that, that completely embarrasses him? That makes no sense. This again contradicts this whole theory of him making up the Quran. It makes no sense. Anyway, so because this is what, and, and this is what uh, most of the scholars says that because the thing that Allah SWT talks about is the fact that he was hiding from Zayed is that he would marry her. However, he didn't want to, you know, be criticized by the uh, by the Arabs at the time. So he hid that information and, and said that, no, you should keep your wife. And he shouldn't have done that, which was, it, it was wrong for him to do that, which is why Allah SWT criticized him. But if the Prophet was really making up the Quran, he would never reveal this. So again, this completely contradicts uh, Ritwan's theory. Uh, and this is why Allah SWT criticized Prophet Muhammad As a matter of fact, this actually proves that Quran was not written by Prophet Muhammad uh, Because if, if anything, he would, pr uh, he would never like reveal this information to the public if he was really making up the Quran. And this is the op opinion of the majority of the scholars. Uh, almost most of the scholars uh, agree that uh, this story is a fabrication. Uh, some of the scholars that uh, says this are Al Zuri, uh, Bakar bin Ala Al Kushari, as well as others like Hakim Al Tirmidhi, Kadi ibn Al Arabi, Abu Hayyan Al Andalusi, Ibn Al Qayyum. Ibn Kathir, Ibn Hajar, Al Askalani, uh, Al Bayhaki, uh, and Al Alusi. Uh, now you can read about this in their books such as uh, Jami Li Akham Al Quran, volume number 14, uh, page number 190 to 91. Uh, Nadwar Al Usul Fi Ahadith Al Rasul, uh, volume number 1, page number 597. Aham. Ahkam al Quran, volume number 3, five, uh, page number 578. Al Bahar al uh, Muhit uh, fi al Tafsir, volume number 8, uh, page number 482. Zad al Maad uh, fi Haidi Khair uh, al Ibad, uh, 26, volume number 4, uh, page number 266 to 267. Tafsir al Quran al Azim. Volume number 6, page number 425. Fatalabari, volume number 8, uh, page number 523 to 524. Nazam al uh, Durar fi uh, Tanasab al Ayat wa al uh, Suwar, uh, volume number 15, uh, page number 358. Ru al Mani Tafsir al Quran uh, al Azim wa Sab al Matani, volume number 11, uh, page number 204. Also, if you want to get more details, <laughs> There is this amazing article by the brothers from ikra.com, uh, ikra.org, uh, who, who did an excellent job refuting this claim. Uh, you can read about it, I will post the link below, check them out. So here Ridwan is committing the false equivalence fallacy. He is equating two different arguments. So the first is that the fabricated story of Prophet Muhammad falling in love and being sexually attracted to Zainab and the Quran saying that the, he concealed something, which is the fact that he was going to marry Zainab. Now, these are two completely different arguments. Now, 
there's a great difference between the idea that what the Prophet ﷺ was concealing or hiding in his heart was love for Zainab and the fact that what he was actually hiding was the idea and thinking of marrying her. There's a big difference between the two. Now, let's discuss some of Ridwan's stupidity. Ridwan, without realizing, actually contradicts himself. So his theory is that Prophet was sexually attracted to Zainab, therefore uh, he made up the verse, right? This is his theory. What Zaid didn't know at this point was that Muhammad really wanted a piece of that Zainab. Muhammad married her immediately and released the Quran first. However, in the same video, he also says that the Prophet was not sexually attracted to her, but actually wanted his son to marry her. Therefore, he made up another verse. Much later, Muhammad suggested that Zaid should marry his cousin Zainab. She refused first due to her status and because Zaid was a former slave. But then Muhammad turned that suggestion into an order and released the Quran first. This makes no sense. <laughs> if the Prophet was sexually attracted to Zainab, then why on earth would he make up a Quran verse suggesting that his son Zaid should marry her? So which one is it with one? Was the Prophet sexually attracted to Zainab or not? I mean you cannot say that he was both sexually attracted to her and not sexually attracted to her at the same time. This is a contradiction. So again I'm gonna make another argument here. Premise 1. Ridwan claims according to his theory that the Prophet made up the Quran. Premise 2. If we find anything that contradicts this theory, it would prove this theory false. Premise 3. According to the theory that Prophet Muhammad made up the verse, uh, chapter number 33, verse number 36, because he was not sexually attracted to sign up and wanted his son to marry her. So basically, according to this theory, he wanted his son to marry Zainab because he was not sexually attracted to her. Therefore, which is why he made up this verse and forced his son and Zainab to marry each other. Then, Premise 4. However, also according to this exact same theory, the Prophet was sexually attracted to Zainab and wanted to marry her himself. So he made up the verse and the chapter number 33, 37, the verse to write after it. Premise 5. As a result, <laughs> The theory contradicts itself because the Prophet cannot both be sexually attracted to Zainab and not be sexually attracted to her at the same time. Therefore, this theory is proven false and Ridwan is proven to be a both is proven to be both a liar and a moron. I mean, it's not like that he has never seen her before. He has actually seen her multiple times before the marriage. You can read about this in Zami al Bayan al Tafsir al Quran by al Tabari, uh, volume number 20, uh, the heading number is 271. This headed in this Tafsir report through this Isnad are actually Sahih and accepted since they are known and to have uh, transmitted uh, in writing. See also uh, Turifi Abdul Aziz al Tariq. Uh, uh, Asanid al Tafsir, uh, page number 67 to 68. Also, to put the final nail in this obvious coffin, Zainab actually agreed to the marriage proposal, thinking that it was from the Prophet himself. But the, then she rejected when she learned that it was actually from uh, for Zayed. It read about this in Zami al Bayan, Fi Tafsir al Quran by al Tabari, volume number 20. Page number 271 to 7, uh, 272. Uh, Mojab al-Kabir by al-Tabarani, uh, volume number 24, uh, 45. Uh, the page number is 123 to 124. It was reported from Katada. You can also read about it in Al-Haytami, Mojab al Zawid, uh, Zawaid, uh, volume number 7, page number 91 to 92, and Hadith number is 11,275. So the Prophet knew that Zainab liked her and wanted to marry him uh, and according to this fabricated story, he also liked her apparently, wanted to marry her and yet refused to marry her and forced his son to marry her. How does this make any sense? On top of that, this narration of the Prophet being sexually attracted to Zainab is both weak and a complete fabrication. So. Not just that there is more evidence that suggests that the Quran does not solve uh, the Prophet's personal issues, 
Now, again, you can see this is this theory makes no sense. It's a com it's complete bullshit. The prophet was not making up any verses because it doesn't make any sense for him to make up these verses. Okay, it's it's, it's it, it contradicts itself. It makes no sense. This is such a stupid conspiracy theory, Vidwan. Come on, you can do better than this. Anyway, also there is multiple multiple cases where. In the Quran, Allah SWT criticizes the Prophet and there are multiple cases where Prophet Muhammad was went through a heavy persecution and no Quran verses reveal. Uh, there are many cases where Prophet Muhammad could have, if, if he was, for the sake of argument, if he was making up the Quran, there are many cases where he could have taken an opportunity and make up a verse, but he didn't. For example, one of these stories can be found in Sahih al-Bukhari, where we read, The sun eclipsed in the lifetime of Allah, Allah's Messenger Muhammad on the day when his son Ibrahim died. So the people said that the sun had eclipsed because of the death of Ibrahim. Allah's Messenger ﷺ said, The sun and the moon do not eclipse because of the death or life of someone. When you see eclipse, pray and invoke Allah SWT. We read about this in Sahih al-Bukhari 1043. Now here we can see an interesting situation. After the death of the son of Prophet Muhammad an eclipse happened. People started saying that this eclipse happened because Ibrahim died. However, the Prophet rebuked them and criticized them by saying that no, eclipses don't happen because of someone's death. You should pray to Allah SWT instead. Now, now, the question arises, if the Quran solved the Prophet's personal issues and therefore it was written by him, then why was no Quran verse revealed at this time? I mean, think about it. If the Prophet was really making up the Quran, then why didn't he use this opportunity and say that no? No, 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 the eclipse happened because the death of my son. I mean, if, if anything, this is the perfect moment to reveal a Quran verse. I mean, the people are already believing that the son has eclipsed because his son has died. He, can, he just has to uh, confirm their bias. All he has to do is, uh, is reveal a verse or say that, yes, the, 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 the son has eclipsed because my son died, you know, I mean... If he really was a fraud, isn't that what you would do, Ridwan? Yet, we see none of that. As a matter of fact, we see the Prophet telling them that no, the sun and the moon do not uh, eclipse because of someone's death. It's a, it's a dogma, it's a superstition. Again, this contradicts your theory, Ridwan. This clear-cut contradicts Ridwan's theory. But so this shows that Quran doesn't always solve the Prophet's personal issues or even appeals to him. Sometimes the Quran criticizes him and goes against him. We see this happening over and over. If the Quran really was a man-made book written by the Prophet, this would never happen. No one would criticize themselves or undermine themselves or not use a golden opportunity like this eclipse to you know, brainwash the masses to think that uh, you're the Prophet. This shows that the Prophet was being honest. He wasn't lying. He wasn't a liar. So again, I make the same argument. Premise 1. Ridwan claims that the Quran solves the Prophet's personal problems or appeals to him. Therefore, it was written by him. Premise 2. If you find anything that contradicts this theory, you would prove this theory false. Premise 3. We see that the Hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari 1043 does not solve the Prophet's personal problem or supports him or even appeals to him in any way. If anything, it contradicts his, uh, his uh, supposed uh, mission uh, that he was making up, apparently, according to the theory. Therefore, Ridwan's theory is proven false. Prophet was not a liar. He was not making anything up. Now, with this, I'm done with this clown. Inshallah, I'll see you guys in the next video. Zazakallah khairan. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Oh, and by the way, don't forget, stay away from Ridwan. Stay away from Apostle Prophet.